um, you take the 10% most carbon intensive installations in the European Union. Could you go to the next slide, please? Um, there are basically three open issues that still need to be discussed. Um, when we think about in which direction the CBIM might or will develop in the future, first, of course, is exemptions. Um, so basically, the only thing that allows you to get some kind of exemption from paying the CBIM is if the partner country also has a carbon price. Um, and this carbon price gets subtracted. So let's say in the European Union, we have 80 euros and the other country has 10 euros. The importers only need to pay the difference, the remaining 70 euros. Um, but if the other country has like very ambitious renewable portfolio standards or uh, other standards, this doesn't actually um, mean that they pay a lower carbon price. Of course, they will produce in a cleaner way. There will be fewer emissions that are counted, um, but the, the price they have to pay is the same. And some people have actually argued that this should be um, also taken into account, especially if you think about um, getting the US on board because the US won't have a carbon price soon probably. Um, but it might be very contentious from a WTO perspective um, because WTO law would very likely not allow this. And also, of course, from a political perspective, because then you have to decide, well, is the US um, IRA a good policy and the Indian um, energy efficiency standard not? And this, of course, creates a lot of conflict. Um, and thirdly, there's also what's interesting, no exemptions for low income countries. Um, some people have argued that low income countries don't really export a lot of carbon intensive products in the first place. And also, even if you excluded them, um, this wouldn't be a lot of emissions you don't cover. And this might actually um, prevent adverse development outcomes and make it easier also. So for instance, Mozambique exports a lot of aluminum to the European Union and one might think about excluding this. Um, then what I already mentioned, the um, question how to deal with European exporters is a big thing. Um, so far, these European firms, of course, pay the common price and if they export, they don't, they don't get it back. Um, you could give them a rebate, which might be quite problematic from a WTO perspective. Um, my colleague, Michael Milling and myself have actually developed a proposal as an alternative to um, give innovation support for export intensive industries without um, targeting exports as such um, to also kind of level the playing field on the um, international market. And there, I guess, this whole topic is still under discussion. And third thing is the use of revenues. So, um, of course, the CBAM permits firm spy or importer spy um, check generate revenues and this is an own resource that means it goes to the EU budget um, and basically it's used to pay back debts from uh, the debts that have been taken up during the pandemic. Um, there's some um, requirement that member states should increase their development assistance to actually give back some money to the trade partners. But of course, it would be politically more straightforward to just give back the CBAM revenues directly. And if you uh, gave them back for green spending, this might also um, level the playing field and make their um, industries greener and make it easier also um, to not um, be, let's say, hit as hard by the CBAM, um, which could actually create also kind of political um, yeah, leverage. And final slide, I think, um, if you go one further. Yeah, so um, basically the question is in how far could a CBAM help to accelerate global action? Of course, it could push other countries to do more, but it might also create a conflict if China, India feel they're treated unfairly, they might even um, not be willing to advance on climate policy. So this actually goes both sides. And in this um, policy forum that we published last year, we argue that the CBIM as such is not the basic building block of a climate club. If countries come together and form a club, they 
if they have ambitious climate policies, they need to apply some CBAM, but these CBAMs might be very different between countries because they have different carbon prices, they have different institutional settings. So it should be more seen as an enabler of ambitious policies in these countries. And countries would actually be very careful in how to apply it, how to also enter a dialogue with the trade partners and also complement it by more cooperative approaches, for instance, to advance trade in environmental goods and services, to build green materials clubs, lead markets, and also um, agree how to actually um, advance trade in green technologies. So I think that's all from my side. And I would like, to, yeah, on, on the slides, you can find some references. And if you're interested in any of those topics, um, yeah, feel free to reach out. And I'm happy to hand over to the next presenter. And I'm looking forward yeah. to discussing. So. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot, Mike, for uh, a really concise and critical overview of 20, 30 years of scientific work on uh, the border uh, carbon uh, adjustment mechanisms. Um, I think we can still take one question uh, um, before we take all the questions in the end. Do we have a question from the audience? Uh, not here, so maybe we just have to warm up the floor uh, gradually, um, but I'll take your proposal. We can move to Bertram, our own from CML. Bertram, you can share your slides. Great, so this works first time around. Uh, there we go, can you see my screen? That's beautiful. OK, great. Then first of all, I would like to thank all of you for attending this uh, this uh, session on on CVM. And I want to thank uh, uh, Mike for the great introduction. So uh, that's uh, going to save me a lot of time and we can just uh, uh, jump right into the uh, the, the work that uh, Run Run, Rutger, uh, Arnold and I have been doing uh, uh, this last uh, couple of months. And uh, essentially what we've been working on is a strategic scenario analysis. And so uh, I would like to uh, uh, start off by, 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 by continuing some of the points that Mike made uh, regarding the way that uh, CBEM is currently formulated, right? So um, uh, uh, CBEM is currently very much focused on, on direct imports, right? So, so uh, materials that, that, that cross the border per se. And so uh, what we have identified and what's also mentioned in the, the impact assessments of CBAM is that there is a potential that the, the, the carbon leakage that Mike mentioned actually shifts downstream, that uh, instead of importing, uh, for instance, aluminum directly, it's going to be put into a product, for instance, a car, and then the car will be imported because that kind of circumvents uh, the way that CBAM is currently uh, formulated. And so we were very interested in seeing if we could put a number on what the difference would be in terms of, of, of coverage of CBAM uh, of either being focused just on the direct imports or uh, identifying all the streams of the, the sectors that are currently uh, under scope throughout the entire global value chain where the EU acts as a supplier. And so it can act as a supplier either for intermediate products or for final products. And so that was one, that was the first part of, of the exercise uh, that we carried out. Uh, and then the next part of the exercise uh, regarded the, 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 the scope for improvement, essentially. And so um, the way that we looked at CBAM was uh, in, in some way or another, uh, incentivize uh, non-EU actors to, to, to uh, reduce their greenhouse gases. And so the way that we uh, formulated a scenario was to see like, okay, what would happen if uh, non-EU partners would uh, um, produce uh, at a level that's less than or equal to the EU EU 27 average, right? So the, 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 the uh, industries within the EU, they have a certain uh, emission intensity, so a certain amount of greenhouse gases uh, emitted per million of euro, and then we, we uh, use that number as a substitute for non-EU partners to see uh, what would happen with the uh, greenhouse gas reductions. And so uh, uh, these are the, the, the results that we have so far. So on the left hand, uh, you see the uh, what we say the coverage of CBM in, the, in both scenarios. So on the very left, I can, I'm not sure actually, can you, I can probably turn my pointer into a uh, laser pointer. Yes, can you see my laser pointer? That's beautiful. 
Okay, excellent. So uh, this is the greenhouse gas that's currently under scope with uh, the current phase of CBAM, right? And we, we found a number of uh, 52 megaton CO2 equivalents, uh, where the majority was made up of uh, direct imports for iron and steel. And then if we move on to the entire global value chain where the EU acts as a supplier, we found a sevenfold increase. Um, and also what's interesting to see is that a large portion of this increase can actually be attributed to uh, electricity uh, because a lot of the products that are that are being produced require a lot of electricity, but the, that electricity typically do, doesn't uh, uh, leave the country, like it's only being used for domestic production, right? So this is, uh, uh, this is the reason why you see it very much shown up here and it, it's in very limited amounts in, in, the, in the, the, the current formulation of CBAM. Uh, so that's that's the left part of this graph. So this is the essentially the baseline of the, of the greenhouse gases that will be under scope for CBAM. And then if we move on to the potential reductions, uh, we see that uh, with the current phase, we find a potential reduction of uh, 29 uh, megaton CO2 equivalents. So to recall, this is what would happen if non-EU actors would produce uh, uh, according to the EU 27 average. And then if we repeat that exercise for the, the global value chain of EU supply, we find a re potential reduction of uh, 231 um, megaton CO2 equivalents, uh, which translates to an eightfold increase. So there's, there's a great potential uh, to, to increase the, 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 um, the effects of, of a CVM according to our studies. Uh, and so the last part of our exercise was to evaluate the uh, sectors that are currently under scope. And so what we did was we uh, essentially repeated this exercise, but then for all sectors in the economy, and then identified what sector would show the, the highest uh, potential reduction. And so that's what we found here. So um, this is the, 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 the coverage, uh, the greenhouse gas coverage that we see now. Uh, this would be the uh, the potential reduction for uh, CBEM right now, and so ASAFIS, that's the the uh, the acronym that came up with of the the sectors under study. So that would be aluminum, cement, electricity, uh, fertilizer, iron, and steel. And then we find here that if we add chemicals uh, as a sector to the the CBEM scope, we find that the potential reduction for direct imports is uh, 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 added with an uh, uh, with another uh, 46 megatons. Uh, so that, that that's quite a large increase. And then if you uh, look at the supply chain, we find that adding chemicals to the scope, um, we increase the greenhouse gas reduction potential by 71 megatons. Uh, so, uh, in short, uh, so what we did was to, to explore uh, what would happen if the, the scope of CBAM would be uh, expanded to the entire uh, global value chain of EU supply. Uh, we looked at the potential reduction that could be achieved if the non-EU uh, actors would uh, operate at an EU27 average. And then we looked at uh, uh, how the scope could be increased in terms of sectors uh, to increase the, 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 the greenhouse gas uh, reduction potential of CBEM even more. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And then uh, I look forward to uh, yeah either your questions now or at the end of the session. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, Bertram. Great job. Um, I um, uh, enjoy your presentation, no matter how many times that I've uh, been in. I can say that. Um, so I think we have time for one or two questions, or we can also wait till the um, the uh, panel discussion. I think we have one question. Yes, from Timothy, actually. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not really part of the audience, but I'm still interested in a question. Um, can you tell me a bit more on how you have computed your um, potential emission reduction? I'm curious because um, I, I will not talk about that in my presentation, but we have also some estimations uh, in the same direction, and by the way, they are quite similar yes. in terms of order of magnitude, which is also very nice to see your results. But yeah, the, these emission reduction things, I'm curious to see how you computed that. That's great. Uh, so if it's okay, I would like to briefly switch over to another screen because I have a little graph to explain that, but it's not in this presentation. Do we have time for that, Ron Ron? Um, yes, maybe two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Yeah. I got this, okay. <laughs> yes, I know you got this. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Let's see. Um, um, we go. Then we've got it right over here. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, so I've got a figure here ready. I hope it's gonna going to make sense. Uh, there we go. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's coming Beautiful. up. Yep. Okay, great. So your question was how we recalculated this uh, uh, this production potential, right? Uh, and so essentially, it consists of two steps. So on the one hand, it was uh, calculating the uh, the average of emission intensity for the for the EU twenty seven, and what we mean with uh, emission intensity is how much CO2 or how much uh, greenhouse gases are emitted uh, per million of euro uh, produced. Um, and so, uh, so we calculated it for the entire uh, EU27 average, and then we compared that with all the uh, emission intensities of non-EU countries, and then we compared whether it was higher or lower or equal, right? And then we adjusted for that. Uh, so um, one consideration which is maybe a bit beyond the scope of this uh, of this uh, answer is that we did take into account PPP adjustments in the sense that um, um, the, the 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 pricing of products uh, differs across countries right so that's why we wanted to to uh, adjust for that to make sure that we have a, a more accurate picture of uh, what would happen if a particular country would operate at the EU27 average. Uh, and so that's what this figure comes in. So uh, here, for instance, you see that, uh, let me recall, this is for the imports of iron and steel, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And so let me bring out my laser pointer again that I have right over here. Um, and so on the X axis, uh, or sorry, Y axis, you see the emission intensity. So this is the amount of greenhouse gases per million of euro. And then this is the amount of imports uh, that we have. And so uh, this gray bar is uh, how much we're currently importing from India, so the, the greenhouse gases. And so if India were to adopt the uh, emission intensity of the, e uh, uh, of the EU, like the average, then it would drop down to this. And then uh, the difference between these two bars is shown in green here. And so this would be the, the greenhouse gas reduction potential for India, for uh, iron and steel coming out of India. Th does that? Make sense? Does it answer your question? Yes. Very okay. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Bertram. Now it's time to um, switch over to our industry voice, industry representative from uh, the China Automobile Data Center. Uh, Jianxing, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I would like to share my screen. Uh, can you see yep. my screen now? Yes, very okay, well. Okay, good. Uh, okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Li Jianxin, and I'm from the China Automotive Carbon Digital Technology Center, and uh, I'm talking from China right now, so uh, it's a pleasure for me to meet you all virtually, and I appreciate uh, Rana for inviting us, and it's a uh, Amazing to have this discussion with all the experts. So as for a foreign uh, industrial company, uh, I would like to share some thoughts from the industry perspective on CBAM and some concerns that we receive from our partners. Uh, so first, I would like to give a background of, of what we are doing. Uh, the full name of our company is China Automotive Technology and Research Center which is also known as Qatar, and uh, we are a state-owned company uh, in China, and uh, we serve for the automo automobile uh, industrial chain in China. Uh, we have a quite complex organizations, so uh, in context, uh, like uh, in context of the climate change and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we have a new subsidiary of this uh, carbon digital company this year. So we're focusing on the carbon related business for our, for our uh, customers. And uh, this is the business scope of our new companies. We serve for the automotive players, the government and the financial institutions 
It helps our partners to build the ability to tackle with carbon-related issues like the knowledge planning and the digital tools. And to the government, we provide suggestions for the policymakers. We do research on the standards and we provide like the data and the platform. Uh, so as uh, so as you can see, coming back to the to our topic, the automobile uh, companies are not currently not included in the scope of CBAM right now. Uh, but the major materials for car production, such as the steel and the aluminum, are both the, the, the big target for the CBAM. As for a, uh, passenger vehicles in China, uh, nearly 50% of the vehicle is made up by the steel and 10% is made up by the aluminum. Uh, so, uh, and uh, an A-class uh, car the curb weight is about 1.3 tons. So the first pressure for us is that we we are facing a increase of the cost for the production. And uh, EU is one important uh, international uh, market for Chinese auto companies, especially when our uh, domestic market is shrinking. And uh, uh, we have like a lot of auto companies and they are keep increasing their capacities. So this kind of uh, product, they need to go somewhere, maybe international market. Uh, so uh, so for uh, so a company outside of EU, they need to like to pay. So another problem that we face that is that for like, uh, uh, like we found that uh, for some automotive automobile parts such as the screw and the nuts that already been required to submit the carbon emission report so a, a car company outside of eu they need to like to pay extra time or manpower to to like to report the carbon emission uh, let alone there's are hundreds of materials and uh, parts of a car so it's it another problem for us. And the second point I want to share is that we are not ready yet. With the implementation of the CBAM, the free quotas is getting lesser. And as you can see that from this graph, the carbon price uh, is climbing these years. And in China, although we have some pilot uh, local carbon trading system starting from 2013, uh, but the national ETS is started in 2021. Uh, so on, and only the electricity is incorporated into the national uh, carbon trading market. Uh, so most companies are not familiar with the idea of CBAM and they have like uh, li limited knowledge to tackle with all the issues. So comparatively, EU has started to build the EU ETS since 2005, but uh, like the CBAM, they had it has a, a transition period. It is uh, about less than three years. So I, we we think that it will be a big shock for most companies, such as the Chinese companies. And uh, uh, the last point I want to make, I want to share is about the fairness. Uh, I think uh, the nature of uh, carbon price is for trading should be uh, reflecting the cost of carbon reduction and it should be different for each country. So for the developing country, it is easier for them to like cut the emissions, which means that they should have a lower cost. But according to the EU CBAM, the price is determined based on the carbon price of the EU ETS. So I think that the mechanism is like uh, a little bit unfair to those developing countries from the global perspective. And uh, it, I, uh, we, 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 seen, we think that it, it seems that it may not be the most effective way because for the developing countries, they need to pay like to pay more than they should pay. So uh, maybe this will get them less motivated for the like the carbon 
reduction activities. Okay, so uh, that's all I can share, and thanks for your listening. And I have to mention that uh, most of these materials are prepared by my colleague Zhang Hongjie. I'm not sure if she is <laughs> in this uh, room. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Jianxin, for the first hand uh, information and the insights, uh, which, um, as we all know, as policy modelers, is uh, really valuable and uh, unconventional for us. Uh, so thanks again for sharing. Then we'll yeah. have you in the discussion, because according to our experience, let's go yeah. with the talks. Uh, so you. Timothy. Um, yes, I will try to share my screen. Yes. So it's coming up. Yeah, please tell me when it when it appears. Is it working? Not so yet. <laughs> uh, do, do, do. Okay, wait, let me try again. Yeah. yeah and the, the connection in Germany is not so good as you we yeah, you still don't see it, anything. So we know it's going to work. Um, otherwise, I have yeah. your slides. Yes. Let me try a final time. Yeah, a three time is a charm. Yeah, don't think it works, right? No, it's weird, right? Well, I mean, when you when you put on your your camera at the beginning of the session, it also took a little while to synchronize. Mm. Like yeah. We saw a black screen and then it popped up. So we're currently seeing a black screen. Yeah, otherwise, uh, Jen, Jen, if you have the, the slides. Yes. Like let me share. Why am I happy can... to do this? Um, share. Yeah. Okay, stop sharing. And uh, you have it, right? Yes, I see your screen. Yeah, yes. even better than mine. Yeah, yeah. So yes, <laughs> I will start right away. So thank you for having me uh, in this session. Uh, very happy to talk about the work I published earlier this year uh, with Mike and some other co-authors, including Hauke from, from CML. Um, so yeah, we can go to the next slide already. So we, in this work, we are trying to look at the, the impact of the, the European CBAM on the other countries. So basically, the, we think that, I think the CBAM is quite a turning point in climate policy because it is a unilateral policy, that means it is a decision of the European Union to apply it, and it has multilateral effects, right? Other countries will be affected by the CBAM. And as of today, we don't know a lot about the exposure of other countries to CBAM. And actually, when you dig into the literature, there are some studies on the US and China, but when it comes to the rest of the world, basically, you don't have much information so far. So there are some studies starting to, to come out on that, and our studies in, in that direction. So what we have done is that we have used um, multi-regional input-output data uh, to so first benchmark different Im implementation options, a little bit as Bertram has do, but I will not talk so much about that, about that because it's been already covered and we have quite similar results. And mostly to also assess the exposure of um, low and middle income countries to, to the European CBAM. Next slide, please. So method-wise, we are uh, using a framework that uh, we published earlier this year as well, which is called the through flow based accounting. So the principle is to look at all the emissions going through the European Union. So basically, usually with input output tables, you would look either at, at production based emissions. So basically the emissions uh, caused in, in Europe or at consumption based emissions. So emissions caused by the final demand in Europe, but um, there are some emissions that are not covered by, by either or the other framework. Basically, if you think about still being bought from, I don't know, India for, for making a car in Germany and then sending the car to the US, these emissions are not captured either by the production-based accounting or the consumption-based accounting framework. And so with the through flow, we are able to track all the intermediate commodities as well. Um, so this visualization shows you the, the through flow of Europe and I think that's a pretty intuitive way to understand why the CBAM is a, is a new kind of policy, right? Basically, with a, with a usual um, um, with a usual domestic carbon price, so with the EU ETS, you would basically put a price tag on the emissions on the upper left of the plot, right? So on 
Europe's own emissions. But with the CBAM, you know, put, uh, you know, impose the carbon price on uh, imports. So you all impose the carbon price on companies in other countries that sell to Europe. And not only you impose the carbon price there, but the fiscal revenue of the carbon price is captured by Europe, right? And as Mike already said, uh, the current plan is to use the, this fiscal revenue as own resource. And so this difference between the place, the, the emission take place and where the revenue is collected is creating an incentive for foreign countries, a pressure to implement their own taxation scheme and to, uh, and to, uh, to anchor the revenue that is otherwise um, used by the EU. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so yeah, that's what I just said. So the, this upstream pressure. Um, so here is the map we obtain when we try to look at the, the, the relative uh, intensity of this upstream pressure. So here we are looking at a scenario which is, by the way, quite more ambitious than the current EU CBAM. Um, that would be a CBAM that would cover all the supply chains and all the sectors. So that's in terms of intensity, that's that's quite higher than what, what we will have with the, the, the CBAM that is currently implemented. In the paper, we have results uh, for, for the current CBAM, which are qualitatively quite similar, but obviously in terms of intensity uh, smaller. So what we look at here is the relative upstream pressure. This is basically the share of CO2 emissions of a country that would be covered by the CBAM. Um, and so with this perspective, um, so when we first saw the, this map, we were quite surprised because we would expect that the major polluters, I don't know, for instance, the US or the major trade partners of the EU would be um, the most pressured by the CBAM. But we actually find that a lot of low and middle income countries, especially Northern Africa, um, are very much exposed to the CBAM. The reason is that basically, even though these countries are not huge trade partners for Europe or nor huge, um, huge polluters, a lot of the emissions they create are caused by production sold to the EU. Um, and so basically these countries would be strongly pressured by the CBAM. And this is something that is raising some questions in terms of equity and in terms of cooperation against climate change. Uh, next slide, please. So basically what we've done in, the, in, in this paper is to open a discussion on uh, how can we use maybe the fiscal revenue that is created by the EU CBAM to uh, dampen a little bit the pressure on the most exposed countries? So here you have four different um, scenarios of so that these are back of the envelope calculations, right? That we just looked at oh we could like which repartition key we could use to redistribute the fiscal revenue of the CBAM to other countries. For instance, on the lower left we are um, send like uh, we are setting this. Um, revenue proportional to the climate damages experienced by the countries. And so you can see that with the different um, re um, recycling revenue recycling schemes, you can make winners and losers. And so you sort of can make this, uh, in principle, regressive policies for developing countries um, uh, progressive. Uh, next slide, please. So to, to Put it, to wrap everything together, so we are finding this study that basically middle and low income countries uh, have heterogeneous exposure to an EU CBAM, which is something basically in the literature usually you would have a bit like the rest of the world region. But we find that uh, you cannot like put like South America and North Africa in the same group. Like they have very different characteristics, and that's something we need to put more attention on. Um, Second, basically, the, the UCBAM is putting a pressure on other countries, but we can probably use the fiscal revenue to incentivize it to make the, this policy more acceptable for other countries. And just a small word on the limitations of our study and on my current and forthcoming work. So all I shown you here was like a sort of like snapshot of the, the international trade network. Um, so currently, we are bringing some trade economics models into the, the discussion to try to have more um, to have a more dynamic picture. And we also are in the course of putting uh, some game theory aspect there to see the strategic interactions uh, between country. So as a final word, there is a final, not slide, but like a smaller thing. Yeah. So I think we need to build more bridges between industrial ecology, where we have a very good knowledge on finding where the emissions are, et cetera, and with economics to have a better sense of the, 
the actual interactions that we will have between countries. Um, that's all for my input. Thank you very much for listening to me again and looking forward to the discussion. Um, thank you, Timothy. Um, how about we open the floor um, and then go for the panel discussion with every speaker. Um, and uh, um, those who are in the audience, feel free to turn your camera on or uh, raise up your hand for questions. And the way actually are prepared for a co code floor um, with some uh, teaser questions. Um, so we are really grateful for this panel because we have Mike uh, started with uh, uh, synthesizing for us the critical understanding of the science in the past decades on CBAM. And we have the wonderful speakers sharing the, actually the most recent insights from science, from models, and from the industries. Um, but also we want to steer the, commu uh, the communication or these um, discussions beyond just, you know, uh, CBAM and the possibility to talk about uh, industry ecology, community researchers, how can we conduct research to have uh, more impactful policy outcomes? And um, some of the questions are related to CBAM, some IE tools, challenges, but we don't have to be limited to that. And uh, also, um, I have a question, a generic question, uh, or not so generic for each of our speakers. So if you could uh, answer this question, share your insights uh, with one or two sentences, that would be great. So the question is, what in your perspective is the single most relevant, interesting, urgent, or significant research question that IE researchers i.e. community could pursue to enhance the formulation or the implementation of CBAM. Um, Bertram, uh, can I uh, invite you to start with your answer? Yes, of course. Uh, I, I uh, When I saw this question, there were there were two types of answers that came to mind. So, but I'm going to uh, share one first because I don't want to, you know, take the uh, some ideas away from uh, from my colleagues uh, but um, uh, my first was uh, my first thought was that uh, that our field is in a unique position of, of providing a, a, a systems perspective on the on the potential trade-offs and, and synergies of uh, CBAN uh, in the context of, uh, of the policies of our trading partners so for instance uh, uh, are you know one of the I think more pressing questions that we've we've heard uh, uh, a couple of times in the presentations that were uh, that were given here today was for instance to get insight in the interaction between CBAM and for instance the the Infl uh, inflation reduction act uh, and the effects on the efforts for uh, uh, global greenhouse gas reductions. So well, that would be my my first uh, attempt at answering this question. Yep, uh, thank you, um, Bertram. Then if I go to, we say order on my screen, uh, Mike. Yeah, basically I'm not an, a modeler, um, so <laughs> of course I can only talk from outside perspective. Um, but I've done some work on uh, distribution from a household perspective, and there it turns up that distribution impacts um, greatly vary across household types, and you really need to look at the de detail. Mm -hmm. And I assume this also holds if you look at technologies, if you look at industrial sectors, um, and often, of course, if you do I/O modeling, you have like one aggregate sector, but in reality, this hides like a lot of variation. I think it would be very important to get an understanding what kind of um, variety, what heterogeneity is hidden within these data and also look at really individual industries, um, how different industries or different production processes differ in their carbon intensities and also how easily they can switch to cleaner production technologies. Yep, indeed. Jianxin, uh, you are next. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, from the industrial perspective, I believe that most companies are caring about the, uh, the, the profit because for the companies, the, they need to survive and they need to make profit. So uh, how uh, 
so I think uh, what the companies care about is how we can implement how to uh, how the process does take place and how to how do we calculate the the emission of different products such as for a automobile it, it is kind of a complex system you have a variety of materials how to make the coherence uh, between different products how to reflect the real emission and how to get the uh, accurate data uh, during your like accounting uh, that's mm -hmm. what we cares about because otherwise we, we are not sure how we can to satisfy the requirement how do we get a report uh, stuff like that so th that's my uh, that's my answer Thank you. Yeah, thanks for sharing your candid um, frustrations with us. Uh, and the Timothy. Yeah, so on my side, I will go, uh, I think, uh, quite on in the direction of Mike. I think there is a lot to do with the distributional aspects uh, of the CBAM, both at, at the national level, so oh, oh, consumers will be affected, also oh, companies will be affected, as we just heard, and also at the international level. So that my research is going that direction in looking this will make winners and losers globally, and we need to be very aware of that. I mean, the experience of carbon taxation at the national level taught us that we need to be very careful with these distributional impacts. In France, we have seen what can go wrong when we don't care about these impacts. And we will have the same issues with the CBAM, but at the global uh, level. And that's something we need to put more focus on. And I think industrial ecology with the, um, the, the, the the knowledge of, I mean, you have the ability with LC, et cetera, to go into the details of technologies. And we have to use these insights to, to be creative and to, to propose new policy options to make the, this policy uh, fair and efficient. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Timothy, and your confidence uh, in the community. Um, and uh, you are speaking to many of them here. Um, shall I take some uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, discussion points from our industry ecology uh, audience? Uh, feel free to turn on your mic. Uh, yes, Justin, please. Uh, thanks, Rara, and thanks, uh, thank you for your. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Li Jianxin. Uh, thanks very much for your uh, nice presentation and sharing. I have a question for you. Um, uh, according to your presentation and uh, the knowledge we we had so far, China is actively building its carbon markets and engaging in the carbon trading um, in the automobile sector. Uh, electric vehicles are becoming increasingly uh, competitive especially with the new players like uh, Li Auto, Li Xiang, uh, Neo, Weilai, and Xpeng, as far as, as we know, Xiaopeng, claiming their uh, vehicles either they do not add to, add to the carbon burden or emit significantly less carbon. So, of course, uh, we know that from the life cycle assessment point, uh, standpoint, um, these statements are more customer-oriented. Uh, as an expert in the uh, automobile industry, my first question to you is how do you view the electric vehicles in terms of their participation in China's carbon market? And my second question uh, is uh, to your knowledge, are there currently currently any institutions or organizations in China that conduct the carbon emission assessments for automobile manufacturers or vehicle manufacturing processes? Um, what are the current uh, methods used for the for these carbon emission assessment? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for your questions. So for your first question about the uh, participation of the uh, like electric vehicle companies into the Chinese uh, ETS system, uh, so far as as far as I know that. Uh, the electric vehicles company is not currently not involved into the carbon trading. And uh, I'm not sure if you know that the China has uh, re reinitiated the CCER, which is similar to the VCS, like the, uh, the, the, the project. Uh, um, and we uh, so, uh, they can like to develop uh, some kind of methodology to uh, 
to like to uh how to say that uh, they can participate in a volunteering way, but they are not uh, like compulsory to uh, get involved in the trading market. And for the next question, that I I know a lot of uh, institutions and uh, universities that doing the uh, assessment for the vehicles, especially for the uh, battery vehicles, and uh, uh, our company also do stuff like that and we we are uh like entrusted by the minister of industrial and uh, information uh uh technology and uh, we are working on a uh, carbon accounting method uh, uh standards for passenger vehicles together with the uh, domestic and uh, like the foreign oems in china and our uh, standard draft will be published recently, uh, not published, but for the uh, public consultant recently. And it, if everything goes fine, the standard will be published at uh, 2025. And some universities such as Tsinghua universities, like uh, the China academic, academic they, they all do like the LSA analysis for the vehicles. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Yeah, thank you. Um, do we have further questions from the audience? May I ask? I believe there are some in chats. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for the reminder. Um, yes, we get a question from Molana, uh, which is for you to reflect on LCA and MRL or IO's role in uh, addressing or improving CBAM. Uh, who would like to take? Well, I, I can yeah. take it uh, if you want. Well, in my view, that that's uh, a little bit like in all situations. It seems that uh, MRO is great when you want to have like a global view and an, an overview, and when you want to go in, into the details, LCA is better. Um, so personally, I'm working a lot with input-output uh, methods, but yeah, when you want to go into the details of the CBAM, that, that's always a little bit tricky, and you have to work around the limitations of input output. Um, well, it depends then, yeah, my final answer would be depends on your research questions. But um, basically when you want, I feel the, the earlier work when the design of the CBAM was not defined so precisely was good to do with input output stuff. Now with the current UC BAM being a little bit more clear, probably LCA approaches become more and more relevant in that context. Yeah. Uh, to offer some insights on the other side, you know, process-based LCA, uh, yes, however, data is another issue, right? You know, to get the different products, uh, carbon accounting, um, um, then for different countries, we simply also don't have uh, all those information. And also the uh, administrative, you know, auditing burdens are not to be underestimated. But I do think, you know, going to the title, our field has a lot to do in informing robust carbon accounting for this policy and a more climate policies. Um, then I know that we are approaching the end, um, but I don't really want to do a conclusion, but uh, a further invitation from uh, Hauke and me. Hauke and me have been um, doing the organizations of the sessions together. He couldn't be here today because he has an important project meeting. Um, but the invitation is from uh, both of us and even from CML. Um, then one particular fantastic and concrete opportunities we want to extend to you is that in Leiden, we have uh, the Lawrence Center. They are professional organizers for a high quality scientific workshop, mainly for a week. So they pay for the organization, then they do the organization, we come up with scientific program. And they are specifically looking for two wonderful uh, workshops around sustainability, 
challenges as long as we bring a very interdisciplinary team and our insights are related with enabling sustainability transition. So if you are interested in taking the CBAM topic, you know, we involve trade experts, lawyers and uh, uh, more uh, stakeholders for this topic or another topic, which is kind of the nature of IE and the sustainability research. So please feel free to contact us uh, then we will work together from there. Um, and uh, I want to thank you again for joining the session, and I hope you can join me in giving a round of applause to all our fantastic uh, speakers. And uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you for organizing. Here. Thank, you. thank you. Yeah. Thanks a thank lot. You. Have a good thank remainder you, bye -bye. of this day. Yeah, enjoy Thank the you. rest of the session. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.